Now, I have the honor of uh, introducing our keynote speaker. Uh, Ron and Sana, many of you know, I know Tom and I were excited to hear that he would be speaking here tonight, and we're very excited to have Ron here. And again, we want to thank Andy Gallagher, we want to thank Comcast for their sponsorship of Ron's visit. Uh, Ron covers the most pressing economic and market issues of the day as a senior al an al analyst, <laughs> analyst, a long day, and commentator for CNBC. He also delivers the uh, market scoreboard report to radio stations around the country. For nearly 30 years, Ron has been a highly respected business journalist and a money manager who began his career at the Financial News Network in 1984 and joined CNBC when FNN and CNBC merged. Ron is well known for his high-profile high interviews, including interviews with Presidents Clinton and Bush, billionaire investors Warren Buffett, George Soros, Julian Robinson, and captains of industry like Bill Gates, Jack Welch, and the late Steve Jobs. Ron was named one of the top 100 business news journalists of the 20th century and was nominated for News and, Com and Documentary Emmy for his role in NBC's coverage of 9-11. So Ron and Sana, we're very happy to have you here at UMass Lowell. We look forward to your comments and thank you very much for coming. Jim Kramer, but Jim can't come tonight because it's his medication holiday, so he can be here. I also tried to get uh, the former host of Celebrity Apprentice, Donald Trump, uh, but as part of his uh, presidential duties, he's hosting a series of early Cinco de Mayo parties to shore up his Latino voter base. Uh, so it'll just be us this evening. Um, just kind of bring you up to date on, on the markets. Uh, we were off a little bit today, and as I was checking through the news uh, wires this evening, uh, there was an altercation between a, a Russian MiG and a US F-16 in Syria. So the Dow futures are down about 450 points tonight, so it could be a, be a rough session tomorrow. Um, that's not true, I'm just making sure you're paying attention. Um, <laughs> absolutely fine. We're, we're okay. Um, as Steve indicated, I, I got my start in, in uh, financial journalism in 1984, and it was so far, although it's lasted 31 years, it has been an entirely accidental journey. Uh, I was a film major in Southern California, Cal State Northridge, Northridge in many ways a college that very similar to, to, to Lowell uh, State School uh, that at the time when I started cost $90 a semester. When I graduated, it was $350. Bucks. Uh, today it's $10,000 a year. It's still, like Lowell, one of the best uh, buys in college that you could possibly have. Um, but upon graduation, neither Steven Spielberg nor George Lucas bothered to call me, and so without gainful employment, I called a buddy of mine from high school who was working at the Financial News Network uh, in June of 84. He got me an entry-level position at FNN. I was a production assistant, which meant ripping paper wires for those of you who are not old enough to know what these were like. Uh, instead of going to the computer, you walk over to a bank of news wires and rip the stories, uh, handed them to the anchors, got them coffee occasionally, uh, ripped scripts when they were on paper as well. Uh, and I did that for about four months, and I was then fired. Uh, so four months after I got there, FNM went through a massive cutback. We were taking in a half a million dollars a month and spending a million. And so having been one of the last people hired, I was the first to let go. My, my executive producer came up to me uh, one day in October of 1984 and said, remember when I told you I needed you next week? I don't need you next week. So I went back to the Viking store where I worked in college. Uh, about a week later, 90% of the editorial staff was, was whacked at FNM. And they went to break even overnight. And they left two anchors on the air, who had still known Bill Griffith and Sue Barrera, who are both still on CNBC today as, as full-time uh, players there. Uh, they subsequently ad-libbed eight hours of live television program between them for the next six months. Uh, we cut the staff down to such an extent that there were two producers, one of whom was my friend Casey Lyon, who works at CNN today, was my high school buddy who got me my job, he remained behind, and the rest of us were, were let go. So four months after that, Casey called me and asked me if I wanted his job as a producer, and so I took it immediately and went back to Financial News Network, 
And three months later, uh, Bill Griffith and Sue Guerrero, who, as I said, were for six months were on the air doing eight hours of live television a day, ad-libbing the entire day's news, uh, called in sick on the same day. And an enterprising young producer gave me my first chance uh, to go on air. Uh, the fact that I was that producer is probably immaterial for the purposes of this conversation. <laughs> but, um, there literally was no one else in the room, so I, I got to do a couple of updates. Three months later, I had a full-time gig on Financial News Network doing about two hours a day. Now, I'd never trained to be an anchor. I never studied economics or markets in college. And so I was on the air not knowing what I was doing or what I was talking about. Uh, and if you watch cable television today, you'll see not much has changed. So, so. But you know, I love coming back to schools because you see that look in, 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 in the young person's eyes, which you know many of us have, but certainly not as sophisticated as you guys were, are. Uh, but, you know, we still, in many ways, in the cable business in the early 1980s, we had an entrepreneurial uh, spirit. It was a brand new business for all intents and purposes, even when I got there in 1984. 1979 was effectively when some of the, the first stations like CNN and ESPN went on the air, and FNN went on in 1981. And so in 1984, Financial News Network was in 12 million American households, half of which were distributed through, for those of you old enough to remember this, UHF stations, ultra high frequency, which don't even exist anymore. The other half were cable affiliates, and uh, most of the contracts that we had at the time were not worth the paper they were printed on. So, very loose affiliations, 12 million homes. Today, CNBC is in 110 million homes nationwide. So, it was the early days of the business, and by and large, we were able to effectively create our own opportunities in some ways, uh, the same way you guys can with, with technology. Cable was a brand new technology at the time. It was supplanting, or at least beginning to supplant broadcast television, cutting into their audience bit by bit, day by day, month by month, year by year, until in many ways now it's become, at least for the moment, a, a dominant form of communications uh, that, that we've come to enjoy over the last, the last many decades. It may very well be supplanted, supplanted by over the top. We face our own disruptions in cable television today, when you're, whether you're looking at Netflix or Amazon or a variety of other uh, streaming services that are coming online, this is an opportunity for you, as I had one back in the 1980s, uh, to take advantage of these new technologies. But a couple years after I'd been on the air, I had another rather serendipitous event. I was out visiting yet another one of my childhood friends who was going to school in Chicago at Northwestern to medical school. And so I was going to go out and visit him for about a week. Chicago was actually becoming increasingly important to the financial markets with the development of options and futures and other derivative products that traded off uh, stock markets in New York. So I was going out to hang out with him in Chicago. I hadn't spent much time there. And we did a show on FNN uh, back then called The Options Report, very, very uh, creatively entitled covering options. Uh, and it was uh, something we did in concert with the Chicago Board Options Exchange. So while I was there, I knew my friend was going to be in med school during the day. We were going to hang out at night. I asked Bill Griffith, who at the time was my boss, still an anchor on CNBC, if I could do a live report on uh, the options program that we had that Monday morning and take an options trading class that was being offered at the CDOE that week. Well, the morning that I got to do that live report, uh, that Monday morning was October 19, 1987, the day of the largest single crash in the history of the U.S. stock market. Uh, my first live reporting experience went from being one hit at 10.30 Eastern time that Monday morning to five 12-hour days covering the biggest crash in the history of the U.S. financial markets. And it was a trial by fire experience, and once again, it was a learn on the job type thing. It was a type of challenge that, you know, as you are finding out today, you have to rise to if you're put in the situation. And it was an extraordinary learning experience for me. Because once again, it was, you know, this immersion therapy that I, I began when I got on the air very young. I was 24 when I was first on the air. And we learned as we went, and then we did it again that week in spades. And someone else who was also new at the time to his job was Alan Greenspan, who at the time was the brand new chairman of the Federal Reserve. And within two months of his taking that job, he experienced the biggest stock market crash in the history of the United States. He had just gotten the job in August of 1987. The Dow had just hit its all-time high that month on August 25th of 1987. It topped out, and for those of you who are Familiar with today's numbers, but not so much the numbers of, of 1987. The all-time high in the Dow that year was 2,722. And we subsequently fell 1,000 points in three months. We went down 30% in three months, 23% of which came in a single day. The Dow had gone up 1,000 points in the prior year. So it was an extraordinarily violent move that we saw both on the upside and then subsequently on the downside. But what was extraordinarily important and why I bring this up, because it, it's still applicable today, is Alan Greenspan's model at the time once the stock market crashed, was to flood the economy with money 
cut interest rates dramatically, backstop the entire U.S. banking system, which in turn backstop the brokers, who backstop the specialists and other market makers on the floors, and kept a Wall Street crisis from becoming a Main Street catastrophe. And that became a, became a template for Federal Reserve policy for the next 25, almost 30 years now, where we had seen crises come and go in, the, in this period since 1987, 1990, 91, we had a huge banking crisis in the United States, Fed did the same thing. 1994, Mexico had a peso crisis, Orange County, California declared bankruptcy. 1997, we had the Asian currency crisis. 1998, Russia had both a currency and debt crisis and a huge hedge fund called long-term capital collapsed and almost toppled the banking system in the United States. Once again, the Fed did the same thing. Happened after the internet bubble burst and it happened most recently after we had this credit crisis, although this time with Ben Bernanke running the Federal Reserve, we got into policies the likes of which we'd never seen before. Interest rates in late 2008 were cut to zero. Never happened before in the history of the United States. It tried it in Japan uh, with uh, very little success, but they never fully implemented the programs that Bernanke introduced and then launched a whole series of other unconventional measures that again, backstopped the banks, recapitalized them, allowed corporations to borrow cheaply and come back more strongly, allowed household balance sheets to improve. And we did go through, in this case, unlike prior experiences, a much deeper recession. And, and many of you, even if you're young, have already felt the after effects of this. Your job market prospects appear maybe less robust than some prior generations. I don't believe that's true. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But it was a very serious recession that almost turned in to the second Great Depression, were it not for the actions of the Federal Reserve and other policymakers at the time. Ben Bernanke in his new book argues that we were 48 hours from total systemic financial collapse in the United States at the depths of the crisis. Mervyn King, who at the time was running the Bank of England, at that time said we were within three hours of global collapse. So somewhere between three hours and two days, we were at risk of falling into something from which we probably wouldn't have emerged as, as nicely as we have. And the proof's in the pudding. If you look at what happened, this is what Ben Bernanke studied prior to becoming chairman of the Federal Reserve, the depression in the United States in the 1930s, Japan's policy errors since the early 1990s, both outcomes were undesirable. The US stayed in depression for over a decade. It was 25 years uh, after the 29 crash before the Dow saw its all-time high again. If you look at Japan with the Nikkei at 18,000, it's still less than half where it was at its peak in late 1989 because policies were inconsistent and not as forcefully put in place as, as the Fed undertook back then. I just use that as background because, one, we escaped the Great Depression. The economy recovered. GDP is higher today than it was in 2007. Car sales are higher today than they were in 2007. Retail sales higher today than they were in 2007. Stock market higher today than it was in 2007. The policies worked quite well. And while all that was happening, other things that are much more germane, particularly, particularly the younger people in this room, were going on underneath the headlines. The energy revolution began in 2007 and 2008 when we in the professional you know, financial arena were talking about something called peak oil. In 2008, when oil hit $147 a barrel, we were talking about the world running out of petroleum, that all the fields in the world that were being looked at had effectively started to run dry, and that we were going to run out of oil, and there was a good chance we would see $200 or even $300 a barrel crude. Instead, the fracking revolution took over, and oil today is at $45 a barrel. And it has completely collapsed, and may stay there for quite some time to come. And during this fracking revolution, we also unleashed huge amounts of natural gas. And this is important to you guys for a reason that I'll get to in a second. But we are the largest natural gas producer now in the world. We surpassed Russia two years ago. We're pumping as much crude oil, nearly as much crude oil, as Saudi Arabia on a daily basis. And oil prices and natural gas prices have collapsed. The reason that is so meaningful, it's not just a tax cut to consumers who get the benefit of lower gasoline prices or less costly heating and air conditioning bills every month. But manufacturing, which is going through something of a renaissance in the United States, is coming home from having been outsourced over the last 40 years because wage rates in other countries were considerably cheaper, and so countries like China, like Vietnam, like all of Asia had a cost advantage that is no longer uh, present. And part of that is the fact that energy costs have collapsed so much in the United States that the cost of natural gas, which is one of the single most important inputs in the manufacturing, is one quarter to one eighth of the cost anywhere else in the world. And so we're seeing Airbus open a plane, airplane manufacturing facility in the United States. 
big German gas and petroleum companies are opening facilities in the U.S. U.S. automakers are thriving here at home. Even textiles are coming back. To a town like Mount Lowell, Massachusetts, where this was a town that was built on textiles, and while it's not the same business that comes home, it's less labor intensive, more technologically sophisticated, more focused on software and robotics, even textiles, the first industry to leave the United States when globalization began 40 years ago, is coming home because we have cost advantages in energy, labor markets are more competitive here than they've been in four decades, five decades, and the U.S. is benefiting from that. More germane to the younger people in this room, the technology revolution and the innovation that's going on in the United States is truly historic. And it's, it's not just social media and things like that. Now, I happen to be the proud owner of three millennials. And I understand that uh, their technology is vastly different than our own. When, when I was your age or younger, you know, I was the remote, okay? So when my dad was sitting in a leather chair, absolutely refusing to budge, get up and change the channel. That was my job. With a degree of sophistication that was just shocking for someone of my age that I could manage anywhere from three to five channels on the dial, and uh, even more amazing, adjusting the rabbit ears at any given time. For those of you who aren't old enough to know what that is, we used to have an antenna on top of the TV set, which by the way was not flat screen, it was about this wide, but we would put these antenna uh, units on top and you would adjust them in order to improve the reception. And if it happened to break because you had an idiot little brother or sister who snapped the thing off, you take a coat hanger, stick it in, <laughs> make it a little bit longer so you can get watch the game on Sunday. So that was the extent of our technological expertise during that uh, period. Uh, we are not quite as fluent in, in technology as you guys are. I have a 17-year-old daughter, a 13-year-old son, and a 12-year-old little girl. And I find some of this stuff amazing because uh, my daughters will occasionally have sleepovers and they're texting each other in bed, the same bed. And I go in and I take the phones away and they get all upset and I said, talk to each other. You're in the same bed. You don't have to text each other. And I said, well, you know, you text mom when you're in bed. I said, but I'm in a different room. That is none of your texting. <laughs> so there is a huge gap between our technology and theirs. Um, but the applications of this stuff are truly enormous. It's not just social media, it's not just over the top, which you know Ed and I now in the cable business have to worry about for the rest of our careers. You know, what disintermediation is going to take place? What disruption is coming to television? Well, it's not just that. When you look beyond social media and, and the types of communications technologies that have changed, whether it's the iPhones, the iPad, the iPod, or whatever device you want to use, or whatever service you're going to use, whether it's Spotify or Netflix. Also, someone mentioned 3D printing. This is not just a revolutionary technology in manufacturing, it is a revolutionary technology in healthcare. So if General Electric, my old employer who owned NBC and CNBC before Comcast did, wants to make a perfectly refined aircraft craft engine blade, they now do it with a 3D printer. But if you look at healthcare, and if you look into some of the um, uh, visions that futurists are holding out right now, when you take into account things like stem cell, uh, therapy, genomics, and other biotechnology advances that are taking place, that same 3D printer will print a human organ within a matter of years from your stem cells. If you need an organ replacement, there will be no rejection. They will grow your heart for you, print it on a 3D printer, and then ultimately with the use of lasers rather than scalpels, give you a heart transplant that you won't reject. This is big stuff. This is truly radical kind of science fiction stuff that we grew up on. It was with um, Michio Kaku, who is a, at City College of New York, but he is trying to finish Einstein's unified field theory. But he offered us a presentation uh, at an event last week showing us the future and how some of this is so much closer to reality than we can possibly imagine. Most of this is already being done. This is one of the single most exciting times to be alive. The person who's going to live to be 150 years old has already been born. For those of us, you know, in, in, at the tail end of the baby boom, we might see some of it. Those of you who are younger than we are in the millennial generation, you may very well see all of it. One of you is going to live a lot longer than any of us ever have. And there are both good and bad implications to that. Number one, longevity in the United States has increased by two years in the last two years. If you make it to 65, you're an odds-on bet to be 90. So this is what's happening that, that has, is revolutionary in many, many ways. And it's driven by technology, it's driven by biotechnology, nanotechnology, and this is where the future is going. And 
sorry? You should take better care of yourself, absolutely. Well, if you have a great insurance policy, your kids might feel differently, so I don't know, you know. But, um, but that window closed, by the way, December 31st, 2010, and the estate tax was zero was when we really had to worry, because, you know, kids might have come in around 11.59, you know. Um, but this is, this is big stuff. This is not small stuff. And so, as I thought about not only the Federal Reserve rescuing the system, which was absolutely necessary in 2008, 2009, but these underlying developments that happened at an accelerated pace, kind of created what I like to call Fortress America. We are, in many ways, both in relative and absolute terms, far outperforming the rest of the world. Economically, we're in better shape, even in this kind of unsatisfying recovery that we've had, where underemployment is still too high, housing hasn't recovered fully. We're still outperforming the rest of the world. And, you know, China is fudging its numbers. There's a good chance that they are not only in a growth recession, but may fall into a real recession. This stock market is down 40% from its high, they have 65 million unoccupied homes in China. There are ghost cities in China that are absolutely unoccupied. They spent $6 trillion on infrastructure over five and a half years, some of which is not being used, some of which is uneconomic, and some of it may never see the light of day, even though it stands in, in cities around the, the, the country. Japan is effectively stuck, still somewhere between recession and recovery, still suffering through deflation or falling prices. Europe is flatlining at the moment. There are a couple of bright spots, Germany being one of them. And then you look around the rest of the world, Russia is in a very deep recession, which may explain why Mr. Putin is so adventurous outside his own borders. And then you take a look at Mexico, which is doing all right, but Brazil is in recession with inflation. Venezuela has collapsed. The United States is an oasis of prosperity in the world. And so when people tell you that the game is over, it's, it's absolutely not. It, it has been a wrong way bet to assume that the United States was done. We've had these comparisons to the fall of the Roman Empire and all this other nonsense that's been kicked around uh, on TV. You know, there was a cable television show. There were, by the way, 270 reality shows on cable television today, 260 of which deal with the Kardashians. The other 10, <laughs> one of the other 10, which was among my favorites, was Doomsday Preppers, where people were preparing for the end of times. Now, if the premise of the show had been right, there would have been only one program. It lasted five seasons. So, you know, there's something wrong with the thinking that the game is entirely over when, you know, you're out in the woods, you've got your guns, you've got your canned food, and life goes on. And, and a friend of mine, Mark Cashin, who's on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, talks about betting on the end of the world. He says, well, if you want to do it, you know, you have to be right on timing because it only happens once. And, and if it does happen, you won't get paid. So, you know, it really is a wrong way bet. And so when I look at... at the U.S. and I see many more positive signs. I am not an inherently positive person, I have to admit that. I, when things look bad, when I was talk, giving speeches in 2008, I was telling the wait staff in a variety of places to remove sharp objects from the tables. Because I felt that 2008 was going to be his, a historic event, uh, a cataclysm in the financial markets that ultimately came to pass. And I didn't have any great foresight, I happened to be investing money at the time in a, in a hedge fund operation, and we just happened to see things that made it quite obvious that the, the wheels were coming off the wagon. Um, but the flip side was, once the Fed went to zero, and once we had these programs, and once all these other factors played into the mix, the U.S. looks great by comparison and good in absolute terms. And when you talk about what you guys are doing on a day-to-day -day basis, I mean, it's, it's exciting. It, it tells us that the future it still holds more promise uh, that, that has yet to be realized. And, and I would agree with what everything that the mentor set up here. In addition to that, we have a demographic advantage that other countries simply don't have. Over the next 30 years, Japan will lose 30 million people. They're going into irreversible population decline. That's true in many countries in Europe. China has an enormous demographic problem because of its one-child policy and a shortage of women. The United States has 100 million millennials, 40 million Gen Xers, and 77 million baby boomers. So while we have an entitlement issue because we have fewer workers today, to support those who are retiring, we don't have a demographic issue where our population is going to go into reverse, quite the contrary. And in fact, if we had sensible immigration reform, we would also see additional replenishment of the population that would make the U.S. that much stronger. You're not going to see that in Japan, you're not going to see that in China, you certainly aren't seeing it in Europe today, given how they're handling the refugee crisis. That's just one sign that they're not really capable of absor absorbing an influx of immigrants. The U.S. will and will continue to do it, you know, Donald Trump notwithstanding. Um, and speaking of that, I mean, even despite what I think is the single
craziest election season I have seen in my life thus far. I've been alive for 10 presidents, I remember nine, I was two years old when Kennedy got shot. Um, this, I have not seen this kind of level of, of reality TV style, you know, uh, campaign in, in my entire life. We don't know how it's going to turn out. Um, the immigration problem will ultimately get solved. We'll ultimately let people in. If you go back and read the history of immigration screeds, there's a gentleman, uh, uh, Francis A. Walker, in 1896, who wrote about the immigration problems in the United States. And instead of Hispanics, it was Germans, Italians, Poles, Russians, Jews, Eastern Europeans who were taking good jobs from white Americans, and that somehow this has always been a white European landmass, one we know for 14,000 years prior to the arrival of anybody else, it wasn't. Um, we'll fix this problem as well, we'll address it in such a way that it becomes additive to the economy. But we have relative political stability as well, even despite what we see today. You know, gridlock actually in the United States is almost the best outcome. You know, if a Democrat were elected president, this is not a personal preference, by the way, but I'm saying if this were the outcome, we Republican Congress, a Democratic president, stock market tends to perform better under that combination, the economy tends to perform better under that governmental combination. And so the argument for gridlock right now, with the exception of immigration reform, tax reform, and entitlement reform, those are three big topics. But those are the only three, in, in, in reality, that need to be addressed, along with infrastructure investment in the United States. That is the one missing ingredient that would help technology expand its reach. An enormous infrastructure program focused on the electrical grid would give us a boost that would take us well into the 22nd century, as highways and roads did, turnpikes, canals, railroads, highways, internet, radio, television, electricity, all those things were huge projects that have extremely long shelf lives, enhance productivity, create jobs, raise wages. That's the part that's really missing. That's the part that the two parties really can't agree on. They know the answers to the other problems. They haven't figured this one out. But having said that, you guys will ultimately work towards fixing this. So, I, I, you know, as you look at your job prospects coming out of college, and, and people, you know, certainly do worry uh, that this is an environment in which jobs are hard to find. It's true. The millennials have not yet fully been absorbed in the workforce, so they're becoming the fastest growing cohort within the labor market today. Uh, 55. My, my age folks, 55 to 65, are also growing pretty quickly because we're the tail end of the baby boom and we're still working our way through the economy like a piglet through a python. You know, you see that population bulge. You know, but at the same time, 10,000 baby boomers turn 65 every day and retire. So on the flip side, they're, they're leaving the workforce. What's interesting about the experience that we're having here tonight, and it's happening with maybe younger individuals on the mentoring side um, and, and kids in college, is that the, I think the model for our economy going forward, given that number one, we're going to live longer, and the notion of going from 65 to 90 and not working in a knowledge-based economy where manual labor is not necessarily the principal means of employment, the notion of sitting on the couch for 25 years, as much as I love CNBC ads, you know, daytime TV for 25 years, not a chance. You know, pairing baby boomers with experience, whether they're at the tail end or the front end, and young people with ideas is an extremely powerful combination because you have business experience, practical applications, and then those ideas that generate the excitement that you heard about earlier this evening, where it gives those of us with different types of experience another reason to go back to work. A lot of us, have, you know, in the course of our careers, maybe have accomplished all we wanted to accomplish in a single industry and would like to change and do something that's a little bit different. And we can get excited about going back to work. We can get excited about being challenged with a new idea. We can be excited about uh, addressing issues that really have to be addressed. I mean, the social consciousness among the millennials is, is interesting. I mean, it's different. When I was a kid, so we, had, we had millennials. They were just called hippies, you know, <laughs> in, in the 1960s. And, and their priorities were a little different than yours. It was free love, free drugs, anti-establishment, anti-war. That was the, the 1960s hippies generation. You guys have a different type of social consciousness that in many ways is far more effective. You're looking to work from the inside out as opposed to the outside in, which again is a far more enlightened view, I think, than some of my older siblings and cousins had at the time. Granted, it was a much more tumultuous period than we see today, at least in the United States. But it's encouraging insofar as you're looking to solve problems and you're providing the solutions, which is vastly different from what the hippie generation did. They found the problem and then they tuned out, dropped out, and did other things that were counter, you know, counter-cultural, if you will, at the time. 
And you guys are exactly, exactly the opposite. You're providing the solution. Now, rather ironically, those same kids who were looking for all sorts of, you know, I guess, uh, unencumbered lifestyles, we've had two in the White House, and most of them run financial firms on Wall Street today. So you do grow up and change, and your priorities change, and you have kids, and you know you have to pay the college bills and all the rest of that. But you guys are starting off with much stronger footing, much more fluid in technology, and, and, and I think far more advanced than we were, as, as John was saying earlier, uh, at, at the same age. I mean, the types of problem solving that I was going through in film school in the 1980s, I remember this very explicitly, uh, because it was one of the single most juvenile conversations I've ever had in my life. The first film that I was making in college, I had a director on the project, I was writing it, and I set the last scene of the film in a park in front of a lake. And the director looked at me and said, but using the lake, aren't you introducing a third character to the scene? And I said, no, it's a lake. This argument went on for two weeks. <laughs> and thank God it rained and we had to shoot the scene inside, because that argument would have gone on until the film was beyond over. That was our level of engagement in college. So I'm quite impressed with what you guys are doing with relative to what I dealt with during my experience in film school. Um, I, having gone through that process, though, as a collaborative enterprise, it, it does teach you a lot about how to interface with other people, some of whom uh, can be difficult at times. So. I don't want to just continue on on my own. I'd like to make this more interactive and, and open up it, uh, to questions. I will go so far uh, as to answer queries about the disastrous three-year period in which CNBC forced me to wear a hairpiece. Uh, it is a <laughs> absolutely 100% true story. Um, I do talk about it publicly from time to time because it's good therapy for me. And uh, as I looked around the room, some of you may benefit from that experience as well. So um, there is a microphone available. Please feel free to fire away. And Talk about whatever you like. Yes, sir. Hello, is everyone? Get your microphone and. Great to Great. I'm sorry. She was right because you're graduating. I heard that. You did a job. <laughs> you didn't address uh, the impact that servicing this massive debt that we've accumulated is going to have on our future. Well, it's interesting. So, the U.S. debt. Uh, compared to the deficit, by the way, the deficit, which was just reported for, for the last fiscal year, was $412 billion. It was less than 2.4% of GDP. It was the smallest deficit we've seen since the surpluses exist at the end of the Clinton administration, and it's less than the average deficit over the last 50 years. The national debt is approaching $18 trillion, which is roughly equal to GDP. Debt held by the public, uh, which is a, a measure we use more frequently, is about $12 trillion and roughly 66% of GDP. Um, with interest rates at zero and likely to stay low for an extremely long time, the debt service burden is unlikely to be a problem. In fact, it's lower now than it's been in, in any previous period in modern history when we've run deficits because rates are so low. Uh, the U.S. Treasury, since 2008, has auctioned off uh, one-month T-bills 46 times with a yield of zero. And we've had two three-month T-bill auctions in the last year at zero. So effectively, yes, rates are negative. In fact, I wrote a piece on CNBC.com about the possibility of seeing negative interest rates in the United States. Given that the rest of the global economy is so weak, the Federal Reserve has decided not to raise interest rates in the near term. Um, my bet is the Fed doesn't raise interest rates till the middle of next year. And so with rates at zero, and only likely to go up gradually over time, and I mean really gradually, the terminal rate for Fed funds, the short-term interest rate that the Federal Reserve controls, maybe 2%, <coughs> which by historic standards remains extremely low. So that debt service burden would go up under that scenario, but it would not be the catastrophe necessarily um, that people anticipate. The other part that's really not figured into the equation is that the demand for U.S. Treasury paper, whether it's 10, 20, or 30 year paper, is extraordinarily high because there are a series of new rules that force banks to own high quality paper in order to remain adequately capitalized. So the demand for U.S. Treasuries is off the charts. There's effectively a shortage of U.S. bonds. That's holding interest rates down. China, believe it or not, has sold $200 billion worth of U.S. Treasuries in the last six months and there hasn't been a ripple in the market. At the start of this year, if you would have said China's going to sell more than 10% of its U.S. Treasury holdings, people would have been screaming, their hair would have been on fire, rates are going to 5%. The yield on the U.S. Treasury, the 10 year Treasury today was roughly 2%, maybe slightly below uh, by the end of the day. I'm not that concerned about it now, and ultimately I think if we can find a way to grow, and I think there'd be 
room for this with, with the infrastructure development project to grow more quickly than we have been, uh, we can not only bring deficits down, but ultimately begin to reverse the course uh, and make that debt less unsustainable. But I, certainly in the short run, and, and certainly in the next several years, I'm not worried about the debt service burden at all. I, I think you'd, you'd have some extraordinary event to change the calculus on that that would be meaningful to the U.S. economy. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, first of all, congratulations on your speech tonight. It was very good. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is education. Uh, how do, what do you feel about the educational system to be able to meet the technology requirements of the future? You know, there's only so many games you can learn because it doesn't contribute anything to your preparation to, to the technology of the future. Well, yes and no. I mean, I, I, I'm kind of a mixed mind. I think where the U.S. education system needs to be short, showing up, and, and again, I've got three kids. One is applying to college right now, one's going to be going to high school, one's in seventh grade. Their fluency in technology is off the charts. When my oldest, my 17 year old was three years old, she was navigating this, you know, preschool toddlers. Uh, at the time, it was a you know CD on a computer on a drive, and she was able to get in and out of the game without being able to read and, and master that. Now you look at kids. My son DJs. He's 13 years old. His command of a computer, the speed with which he can operate, the programs he can download, the coding that he can do on his own. You don't even really need to teach the kids technology in school. You need to teach practical applications. Where we're missing things, and I think there's this whole there's this focus, and I think it's misplaced to a certain extent, and I see this a lot with my kids. There's this kind of faux rigor uh, in, in K through 12, where you're moving kids in a nonlinear fashion towards advanced mathematics before they've conquered the basics. You know, we've gone through a variety of different programs as my kids are growing up, writing handwriting without tears. I still can't read my son's handwriting. Now, I have tears, he doesn't care. I mean, he's working on a computer. But the things that most companies are looking for critical thinking skills, the ability to communicate verbally and in writing. The technology stuff, by and large, is taking care of itself. And I think this room is testament to that. Most of these kids don't have to worry about learning the technology. They're developing it as they go. You know, I mean, if you look at what's happened with, at the front edge, whether it's, you know, guys like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, um, they've already created the platforms on which all these applications are built, and then we've got a new wave of kids coming, and then one behind them, that, that are so fluent in technology, the last thing they need to do is go to school and take a technology class. They need to be able to communicate their ideas when they go in front of a pitch meeting and, and, and sit in front of a group of people, they need to be ar able to articulate the concept, not test the technology. If the technology fails, they're not going to get any money. But if they can't articulate the concept, uh, whether or not they delivered on the promise of the technology may be immaterial. So critical thinking skills, reading, writing, uh, verbal communication skills, some of which, by the way, are being disrupted by technology. My 17-year-old daughter, I believe, and I think this number is close to being right, has either sent or received 130,000 Snapchats in the last four years. Now, there is this kind of disintermediation in face-to-face -face communication that's going on with young people today where they don't necessarily feel comfortable having that experience person to person, but they'll say anything they want in a text or a Snapchat story or something along those lines. I don't think the technology part is the issue either in K through 12 or in college. The issue is can you get them grounded in serious basics and move them as we did, I think, and I don't mean to sound like a Luddite in this regard, we went in linear fashion through math. Now they're throwing algebra kids in third grade now before they've finished long division. And you're getting this disruptions in their learning process where if you walk them through and make sure they're fluent in all these things, they'll be fine. They'll always catch up with the technology. You know, we did, they will. Uh, the other skills, I think, are far more important, and that's what we should focus on uh, in school. Now, granted, STEM education is extremely important if we're moving towards uh, and want to move towards uh, more engineering, more technological advancement. Those are math and science skills. Uh, I would skip the technology part almost entirely and focus on those. Yes, ma'am. Ron, thank you for your insight. I'm hoping that you can provide an opinion on something that probably will resonate in the room. Um, an opinion of student loan rates and parent loan rates can range anywhere from 5 to 9%. 
to me, the return on investment is far greater with educating students and adults than it is to buy a car, yes. where you can get a loan for nothing to buy a car. Yeah. Can you provide any insight? Is there anything, any talk? It's, it's great to hear the politicians talk about loan forgiveness, but what about right now? What are they going to do for student loans? And if they change anything, for the people that are in debt now, Will they make adjustments for those, for those people? Yeah, I think ultimately, given that student loan debt has topped a trillion dollars, um, we're, we're going to go through in student loan debt what we effectively went through with mortgage debt to a certain extent. That's not foreclosure because you can't really do that. Uh, and, and the ideas of income sharing uh, with students who give up a future part of their earnings to pay back their loans, I think, is kind of dead on arrival. What we did in the mortgage crisis was something that we like to call uh, lend, extend, and pretend. Right? That's going to take place in student loans as well, with a reduction in the interest rate that kids are paying. Um, the, the small amount of money that I borrowed in college uh, was, I believe, at 7% in an environment where interest rates were at 20. So my first car loan was for 20.5% for one of the hottest cars of the time. It was a, a four-door tan Chevy Nova. In 1979, just, as we like to say at the time, a true chick magnet. Um, but our student loan rates were well below market rates. And today, just the opposite is true. Student loan rates are above market rates by, in, in many cases, a meaningful amount, as you say, by anywhere from 7 to 8, 9%, when short rates, ten, even 10 year rates, are at 2. And the 30 year bonds at less than 3. So there has to be an accommodation uh, because student loan rates are, are out of whack with the market. And part of that came is in 2007, 2006, uh, there were a lot of private loans that were ultimately made that were gouging students because that student loan business exploded uh, during the first wave of the millennials. But we're going to go through a process where it won't be necessarily, there'll be partial forgiveness in some instances, um, but I suspect the interest rate will be lowered, will turn out the loan so that it may take much, much longer, but it becomes less material to your you know, monthly cash flows over time. And that's the way they'll deal with it, at least in, in, in the initial stages of this. I don't know ultimately you know, how you retire that debt. You can't have it go completely unrepaid because it's a trillion dollars that someone will lose. Um, but it, we will term it out, which means to extend it, and, and we'll lower the interest rate ultimately to reduce the debt service burden. So monthly cash flows for individuals will be better than they would otherwise be. I think that's what the solution ultimately turns out. Yes, So um, you mentioned the price of oil going down, and you also mentioned that before you thought the um, amount of oil that is available will be depleted. Um, what about the, the price of oil being down, leading to more oil consumption, and the fact that there still is a limited amount of oil, and that the oil being burned leads to climate change? And how do you think that the inevitable need to switch to renewable energy is going to have financial implications and uh, realistic implications to the future? That's not a loaded question. Um, <laughs> uh, look, I mean, I think we're, we're obviously going through a, a transitional phase with respect to energy production and consumption, both. Um, so, so green energy, as yet, does not provide an adequate amount uh, to, to do everything that we do in this country, whether it's driving cars, uh, powering uh, utilities, manufacturing facilities, and the like. The biggest, I think, transition that would be a, a reasonable compromise is a transition toward natural gas. You fly into LAX and in Los Angeles, there's a natural gas station for cars or trucks that utilize natural gas, and it's a much cleaner burning fuel. Already, the market economy, rather surprisingly, and, and you know this is only felt in areas where coal is mined aggressively, whether it's in West Virginia or other parts of the country, coal prices have collapsed. Coal companies are going bankrupt. Coal usage has grown dramatically as we shift to natural gas. Utilities in the United States increasingly are using natural gas rather than coal. That is a major development. Now, China needs to do it, India needs to do it if you want to have a real impact on greenhouse gas emissions because coal is the single dirtiest form of energy that we have. But ultimately, there's the, the supply of natural gas, from our perspective, from our lifetimes, even yours, is nearly inexhaustible. There's something like a 200 year supply of natural gas which buys us a fair amount of time to get to something that might be more interesting. Lockheed Martin, for instance, is, is suggesting that within the next five years, they will have some sort of portable fusion reactor uh, that is extraordinarily clean. It's a, it's a radical change in technology. We've, we've toyed with fusion since the 1980s and haven't built 
um, a really a reliable or, or even a um, serviceable reactor that, that generates enough energy. They're saying they can do this within five years. We're going to get there. I mean, ultimately, technology solves these problems. I mean, if you go back to the turn of the last century when kerosene was the main use for crude oil that was taken out of the ground, John D. Rockefeller was selling kerosene by the can around the country, and that was his monopoly at the time before autos became so dominant in our culture. We're using kerosene to light our houses. Today, kerosene is used as jet fuel, but crude oil took over when automobiles became so dominant, and we went to a very heavy manufacturing economy. The economy is getting lighter and lighter by the decade, where power usage has shifted towards really just electrical use as opposed to the heavy industrial type of stuff we had in the 50s and 60s. We are in transition. Someone will break this cycle at some point. It may not be wind, it may not be solar, although solar it, you know, is growing very quickly, becoming, uh, certainly it's far more affordable than, than it has been. Um, but there's going to be a wide and blended mix of, of energy alternatives before we get to the point where everything is green. That right now is not possible. We just can't make the shift that quickly. With respect to climate change, listen, this is, this is not my area of expertise by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you know, I, I suspect it is, it is partly induced by man. I mean, you know, the, the planet also goes through a variety of cycles, as does the solar system on its own. We're going into a period now where solar activity will be at the lowest level we've seen since the 1700s, which could create a period of cooling. Uh, the last time it happened, it was called the Maunder Minimum. And we had the Thames River in London freeze over so much that they held fairs on the ice during the winter. So there, there are, you know, ocean streams, jet stream, uh, the temperature of currents in the oceans all have an impact on, on weather. And El Nino this year that is supposed to be massive in nature may wipe out the California drought, but we might have a dry, warm winter in the Northeast. Got it. Um, <laughs> but. Look, it, it, it's a tough topic. I, you know, I, I'm not a climate skeptic by any stretch of the imagination. Something is obviously going on. But I think, you know, listen, I, every storm I've seen in the last 20 years has been the largest storm in history, right? Except that our records only go back 180 years, right? So, I mean, we did have something that ended 11,000 years ago called the Ice Age that lasted for 2 million years. So every time some of my friends uh, uh, on the Weather Channel come up and say, this is the worst winter we've ever seen, I like to remind them that if you wake up with a glacier in your backyard, that is the worst winter you've ever seen. And some of this stuff just happens. Now, granted, we are accelerating the pace of change, and it would be nice if, if somebody bothered to seriously do something. And we cannot do it, by the way, without the accession of China and India getting involved in reducing their greenhouse gas emissions because they're infinitely larger than ours. We've actually come down rather considerably over the last 20 or 30 years. So I think you need those countries uh, to become part of the solution as opposed to part of the problem. But we will, you guys will get us there. It's not going to be us. We're still the greedy baby boomers who have, you know, eaten up everything that we've seen in sight over the course of our lifetime. We have affordable markets and stocks, free in real estate. We've made our money, you know. Once we're dead, you guys will be great. So, uh, <laughs> any final questions before we go? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, two more. Steve, do a time two? Uh, three. <laughs> Let's uh, dial it down to a micro thing. Um, yeah. The possibility of Hillary becoming president, she's advocating that the fact we could be Are you yes. in favor of Tobin tax, or what do you think of the... I'm, the not a huge, I'm not a huge fan of, of, of trading taxes as a mechanism for solving that problem. There are other ways that we can deal with high frequency trading as a disruption in the marketplace by increasing the spreads to a nickel from some pennies. And that just, it's like taking a, a wrench and sticking it in the machine. What do I think the likelihood of Hillary becoming president? About 150%. If you look at what happened today, Biden dropped out. So let's, let's just walk through the process. If, for instance, the Obama administration knew that Hillary was going to be indicted for the email issues, Biden would be in. Now, there is a calculus suggesting that he's going to wait until she gets indicted, then he can jump in and be a savior. The, we, I, I was with Paul Begala and George Will last week at an event. And there's just some simple math to do on the electoral front. Okay? The Democratic candidate, just by dint of blue state versus red state, opens the game with 230 electoral votes. Needs 41 more to win. Needs Florida, needs Pennsylvania, needs Ohio, a couple other states. Somehow needs to cobble together 41 <coughs> electoral votes to wobble with the election. Now, on the other side, we think we don't know who the Republican standard bearer is. 
even though Donald Trump is now 32% approval rating in the Republican polls. I put a prediction out on Facebook today that after the South Carolina primary, Trump will drop out, he will leave the GOP field littered with dead bodies, and Hillary will walk into the White House because there will be nobody surviving after that point who will be a credible candidate until they draft Paul Ryan and he'll lose to Hillary. Um, I think some combination of events is likely. It's very hard for a Democrat to lose the election given the electoral makeup of the United States. Now, if she gets indicted and it falls to somebody else, they could have a problem. But running the table on electoral votes for the Republican Party is a very difficult thing to do at the executive level. The House and then the Senate have been gerrymandered enough that the Republicans will not lose the House. They might lose the Senate. Depends what the next several weeks look like. So if Paul Ryan takes the speakership and, they, and everyone acquiesces to his demands, we'll see a clean debt limit increase that will take us through next year. We'll see a highway transportation bill get funded and we'll see appropriations bills that go through with very little fighting. If he does not become speaker, we run the risk of seeing another government shutdown that maybe lasts longer than the 11 days we saw a couple years ago, and the Republicans go through a self-immolation process in which nobody's viable. And we don't even know among the candidates who really is viable on the Republican side right now. It's very hard to tell. Either this is the greatest publicity stunt of all time in American political history, where Trump has no intention of really running at the end of the day, or he's going to try to be president, and he has to take more than 40% of the minority vote to win. There's a good chance Hispanics won't vote for him. <laughs> Small, but significant. Um, you know, because we're going to have the big welcoming door in the wall, which I think will alleviate anybody's concerns about that. If we deport 11 million Hispanics, by the way, we've lost a million Mexicans over the last six years. There's been a net outflow of Mexicans from the United States, not a net inflow. If we were to deport 11 million people, that would cost $500 billion over two years and would be larger than the internment of Japanese during World War II. Absolutely inconceivable. So he's got, a, he's got another issue when he gets to the finals, if he gets to the finals, that will obviously not play to his advantage. I, I, I still think it's going to be Rubio. Some people are talking about Cruz as, as the most viable candidate. Bush seems to be imploding at, at a rate we couldn't possibly have expected. Um, but you don't know. Trump may want to just try this and see if he can run the table with Carson as his running mate, which is not the possibility he held out yesterday. In which case, our foreign policy will be just so terribly well informed we won't even know what it is. First person from Russia. Yes, sir. Ronnie touched on the Kardashians and Trump and technology. Attention. I didn't do Lamar Odom yet. So, yeah. And attention deficit syndrome amongst the millennials. And yeah. I have a couple of millennials also. You've been in media and distributing information in all its forms for over three decades. You're as old as I am. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, how do you look at the concerns of your information, be it political or economic, today? Do you feel, I have a concern that there's an intellectual apathy amongst the electorate. Do you see a difference in the way people absorb information today? You have a pretty broad swath of the electorate represented this evening. How do you feel as someone who's trying to communicate, communicate truth as opposed to the gnashing of teeth and volume? I think it's never been harder and there's never been a larger appetite for it. We have a glut of information, but we have very little wisdom. And I think this is the problem. I mean, the supporters of Donald Trump have been very generously referred to in the media as low information voters. Um, we used to call them morons. Um, but it, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting use of the term. I, I think, look, there's been so much disintermediation in, in the information process, right? So when you have Walter Cronkite and, and you know, his two competitors, the Hockney and Brinkley and everybody else, we had three newscasts around which every night entire families sat, watched together, and there was a national dialogue that was fairly cohesive. Then we went to cable, and for a period of time that was reasonably benign. It was just more information, reasonably good quality, less well-resourced than the networks, but still people were trying to do their best. Then we went to opinion-based broadcasting, which I think is where um, the proverbial excrement hit the fan. You know, we, had a, we have an echo chamber now that is not only just in cable, but when you take social media and the speed with which information is now disseminated before any of us can check on it, you have a real problem. I mean, you know, it was a Washington Post two days ago inadvertently ran a headline that Biden was entering the race. Fox ran a piece that sources were telling Ed Henry that Biden was entering the race. 
48 hours before his announcement. It turned out to be 100% wrong. We've got the rumor mill, which in the old days in the market terms, like if we heard rumors, the president got shot, market's down 100 points, they actually want to check the rumor out. It gets out so much faster now. I mean, we were the gatekeepers. We we're, now we're like shepherds. You know, we're just trying to keep the sheep in one pen and then trying to let them out one at a time so that at least the information gets filtered. There is no filter on the internet and on social media, so it's very difficult to control not just the pace of information, but the quality. And if you go back to the, you know, unless people don't necessarily like going back in time, but when there was a vetting process for news that was far more robust when you only had three outlets and you had your local papers that were competitive, there was a little more, I think, safety in, in the information. Having said that, there's a great piece by James Fallows that was in the Atlantic a couple years ago about how this kind of golden age of American journalism or information dissemination that would, let's say, went from Cron Cronkite to Brokaw, just to put a wrapper on it, is an anomaly in U.S. journalistic history. I guess I'm out of time. Um, <laughs> if you go back to the early days of pamphletary, even during the colonial days, Thomas Jefferson was roundly attacked for having fathered an African-American kid with Sally Hanks. Right? That rumor was in the pamphlets while he was running for president. So this, this period that we had was, was you know, relatively brief uh, as far as information was concerned. And then you go back and look at American journalistic history, it's never been you know, kind of a clean business with yellow journalism with William Randolph Hearst and all the rest of that stuff. It's hard now, though. I mean, what I see when, I, when I'm in situations like this, people want real information. You know, television consumption has gotten a little different. There is this echo chamber. Half of Bill O'Reilly's viewers put him on because they love him. Half put him on because they hate him and want to scream at the TV. <laughs> and that's true on the MSNBC side as well. When, you know, when we were tilting more left, we were obviously coming back you know, to the center uh, to some extent. So, you know, and, and then you have the polarization of the parties, which just makes it worse. And, and now, I mean, which I think is unique to, at least in my lifetime, is that being aligned with one or the other party is a sin in the eyes of somebody who you're opposed to, right? We, you know, I, I grew up in an environment where you could be a Republican or a Democrat, and you, you would not get it. You might get the heated political arguments, but you didn't hate the other person. It was, you agreed to disagree. Now there's outright hatred, even in Congress. I've been told that if a Republican and a Democrat in the House are waiting for an elevator, they will not go down together. They will wait one, you know, in the old days, Bob Dole would have Ted Kennedy over to his house for a barbecue. They didn't agree on anything, you know, but that particular group of legislators did work together to fashion, you know, cohesive programs, whether it was fixing Social Security in 1983, tax reform, you know, a whole host of things. If they needed a highway bill done, it got done. This, this level of intransigence and this level of polarization is something we certainly haven't seen in this country in, in, in several generations. So it makes our job that much harder. And so part of the default is to be more entertaining and more informative in some instances, right? Because that's, that's easier to put Anthony Bourdain on and that's your foreign news source, you know, as opposed to actually going to Ethiopia and showing people or Rwanda or whoever, you know, where genocide's going on and having a real conversation about it, you know? So, we're diverted a lot, and, and I think that's a problem too. So I, you know, it's 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 an issue. I don't know how we as broadcasters and, and programmers deal with it. Uh, I, if the audience didn't want it, it would make life a lot easier. You know, the, the, listen, the fact that we even care about Kim Kardashian in any way, shape, or form, you know, famous for being famous thing has always been around. We have never seen it magnified this large. You know, I mean, Paris Hilton and, and, and Kim Kardashian got famous for one thing and one thing only. And they built empires on this. You know, it, it, it does astound me in many ways. You know, um, but look, well, it, it's either going to kill us in some way or another because we're going to make horrible decisions based on lack of information, or we'll get smarter and we'll start demanding more from the people who provide it, and then you go back to something else. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So that was really, a, 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 I guess, a challenging and exciting talk at the same time. Um, and we really do appreciate your time and thank you very much as well. Um, so folks, 
Thank you for joining us. You learned a bit about Difference Maker. You learned about our students. You got to hear from the alumni and the sponsors who make this uh, so valuable. You're certainly welcome to stay, enjoy your cocktail. I noticed there's still some desserts on the table. I, and I know we'll see many of you at the inauguration tomorrow. So thank you all very much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again.